So thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope to make this our um, sort of educational as well as I like to, I will take all the questions that you have at the end. Um, and so uh, I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist and I practice at the UCI ophthalmology um, and I see kids and adults. Um, but one of the questions that often get um, since the start of the pandemic and the, um, and the introduction of virtual learning for the kids is, is this going to affect, you know, spending a lot of time on the screen for my kids? Is it going to affect their eyes? Are there anything you can do to help with that? And so I thought the topic that I chose today for the talk would be updates on treatments to prevent myopia progression. And so I'll get started here. Um, first uh, slide is a, I don't have any disclosures. Um, and so first I like to go through um, how do we see, and then that'll help us, uh, or that'll segue into myopia and the topic of myopic progression. And so um, our eyes acts like a camera. Um, the light enters through the front part of the eye, which is called the cornea, which is this tissue right here. It goes through the iris, which is where uh, the pupil uh, constricts with the iris. And then it goes through into the lens, which focuses um, and then it gets projected onto the retina, and then it gets sent to the brain to be interpreted via the optic nerve. And so the cornea, we think of it as the lens of the camera, and as, as well as the lens itself is like the lens of the camera. And then the retina is actually where it's like the film of the camera, where we used to actually have to go develop it. And so um, both uh, structures are important um, in how we see. So what is myopia? And I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already, but myopia is also called short-sightedness or nearsightedness. And as this picture uh, on the right depicts, so um, a, a, a patient or a child with myopia have difficulty seeing the board. And so things that are far away are very blurry. As you can see, the board in the background is very blurry, blurry. but things up close are very clear. So uh, the glasses is actually very clear. And so when you wear glasses for myopia, what it does is that the lens will actually make the, the, the letters on the board clear. So myopia means that you can see up close, clear, but you can't see the distance very well. And so what happens in myopia? Essentially, in a normal eye, the light gets projected on and focused onto the retina perfectly where it's supposed to be. In a myopic eye or in an eye, eyeball that is nearsighted, the eyeball is too long. If you look at the picture on the right, compare it to the picture on the left, um, the eyeball itself is a little bit oblong, right? You can see that it's uh, elongated. And therefore, when the light goes through the, the eye, it gets projected in front of the retina and therefore it, it's blurry. Um, other types of focusing problems, you, can, you heard of farsightedness. In hyperopia or farsightedness, the eyeball is actually too short or too squashed. And so what happened is when the light goes into the eye, it doesn't, it also doesn't focus on the retina, it focuses behind the eye. And then there's a term that you often hear, and it sounds like a crazy word, but it's actually really nothing more than just um, uh, describes the shape of the eyeball. And so, and that is called astigmatism. And astigmatism is essentially um, a description for an eyeball that is shaped more like a football, um, American football, rather than a, a sphere like a soccer ball. And so what happens is when the light goes through the eye, rather than it being focused on one single point in a soccer ball, in a sphere like eyeball, it gets focused into several different locations because of the contour of the eyeball. And therefore, um, you get blurry vision from astigmatism, not because it gets focused too in front of the eye or too behind the eye, it's just simply focused not on the same spot. And that's what we call astigmatism. So because we talk about myopia in kids, um, so what happens to my to myopia over time? And this is what we call myopic progression. Myopic pro progression essentially describes the fact that as kids grow, um, the eyeball grows with them. And so just like how we need to buy our kids new shoes, new pants, they get bigger shoes, they get longer pants, bigger, uh, longer shirts uh, over time uh, because their body's growing, the eyeball grows as well. 
And so over time, as the a, a child progresses from a seven year old to eight years old to nine years old to 10 years old, 11, 12, and as they go through growth spurts, their eyeball goes through the same amount of growth spurt. And so with time, the eyeball elongates. And remember what I said two slides back, myopia is essentially the eyeball elongates and therefore the light gets focused in front of the retina and therefore the, the child has blurry vision or myopic progression. And so uh, this is a this is a, a picture of or the progression of myopia for a patient. Um, so they start off being you know needing minus one glasses for example. The next year they come they you know they come at seven they were minus one. They come at eight they become minus two or minus three. They come at nine and they become minus four or minus five. And so as they grow as the child grows their eyeball grows and they go from minus one to minus two to minus three to minus four to minus five to minus six. And then eventually this child at age 13 is now a minus eight and a minus nine. And so then your question becomes, why, why does it matter? Why is myopia such a problem? They can just wear glasses. And that's absolutely true. There's no, you know, there's no, um, the glasses go up all the way to minus 10, minus 12, minus 13. But there is a condition called pathological myopia, which um, describes the stretching and the thinning of the retina because the eyeball grows so long and so big that the retina does not cannot cover it anymore. And so we call this pathological myopia, where if you look on the on the picture on the left, this is a normal retina. Um, and the picture on the right hand side is a pathological myopia, where you can see there are areas where it doesn't look like it doesn't look orange anymore. It doesn't look like normal retina anymore. And that reason is because it's stretched so the retina has stretched out so much, it's created little holes. And this is uh, this will create problems for the child or for an adult um, when they're older. And as the degree of myopia increases, the risk of eye diseases increases as well. And so on the right-hand side, on the upper right-hand side, this is a picture of a retinal detachment. And so if you have high myopia, your risk of retinal detachment increases significantly. And as you can see on the table on the left, um, on this column, if you, have a, if you have myopia that's low, minus 0.75 to minus 2.75, your odds ratio of having a retinal detachment is only 3.1. But if you have a myopia that's minus nine to minus fourteen point seven five, your uh, your odds ratio is forty four point two, so significantly higher risk of retinal detachment. Similarly, I'm showing you a picture on the on the lower right of a normal optic nerve and glaucoma on the right, um, and so you also have an increased risk of glaucoma if you're highly myopic. Again, maculopathy was the picture that we saw prior, um, where the retina is thinned out because the eyeball has grown so long. Um, and so all of these um, risks of eye diseases increases with the degree of myopia increase. And this is a uh, this is uh, from a paper that projects that over the next um, 30 years, because the fact that we are using more computers, because our, a lot of our students are in virtual learning or virtual classrooms, because of the fact that uh, we are really, our society has uh, migrated toward um, sort of a lot of screen use, um, that the global risk or the global prevalence of myopia will increase as time goes on. So, and therefore, um, so there, this is going to be a problem for us in the future. And so, so the question often I get is, why does a myopia occur? Why does my child wear glasses? Why doesn't every other kid in the classroom wear glasses? And we know that genetic factor is probably the number one predisposition to myopia. If the parents wear glasses, there's a high likelihood that the child will wear glasses. Um, another strong uh, correlator is environmental factors. If the child spends a lot of time uh, working up close, staying indoors, reading, um, learning on the computer virtual classrooms, uh, you have an increased chance of myopia um, and as well as not spending enough time outdoors. And so if a, a kid likes to play outside, I highly encourage them to do, do so. Uh, and, the, and the reason is because outdoor activity actually decreases your, your, your risk of myopia development. And so, and similarly, why does myopic progression occur? Well, Children with myopia generally have a larger amount of myopia as they grow. Like I said, as they 
as they hit a growth spurt, uh, more um, the eyeball will grow and therefore their prescription will get stronger and stronger over time. Um, the fastest growth occurs between 10, 7 and 10 years of age. Um, so when a child is in upper elementary school, uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, um, and then uh, and the last correlator is um, with genetics and environmental factor. Like I said before, if the parents are have high myopia, then the child is more likely to have my, uh, high myopia as well. And if the kid spends a lot of time reading uh, indoors on the screen, on the iPad, then they, they have a higher risk of developing or having myo myopia progress over time as well. So the biggest question I get, and I think the most impor important question here is, can we stop myopia or myopic progression? And the answer here is yes and no. Um, and I will go into detail as to why the answer is yes and no. So first of all, let's talk about what we can do to slow myopia. The, the, the best thing for, for, for me as a pediatric ophthalmologist is to actually encourage behavioral modifications. And this is limiting time on screens. Um, I, I, this is the question that I get most as a practicing pediatric ophthalmologist is how, exactly how long should I tell my kids to spend on the screen? And ideally, like if you ask me, I'd say no screen time, but obviously that is not realistic. And so I often will tell parents, depends on your age and it depends on the need for, for your child to be on the screen. If your kid is two years old, I would say definitely no screen time. But if you're there are five years old, then I'll say, yes, you know, they're in kindergarten, all their friends are in this on the screen. So I will usually say maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes at a time, that's acceptable, but I encourage them to take breaks. And if the, a child is, let's say, five, you know, in fifth grade, 10 years old, then I'd say, you know, they have homework on the screen, um, you know, all their friends are on the screen. So I usually say, okay, an hour a day is okay, as long as it's, um, you know, as long as you take breaks. And one of the important um, rules that we use is this 20-20-20 rule, which is take a 20 second break every 20 minutes and look at something 20 feet away. And the idea of that is really just one, so that they're not staring at the screen for too long. And then two, for them to relax those, uh, the focusing so that they can, and that's the 20 feet away, is so that they can actually look at something at distance and not really string their eyes for, for too long. And again, like I said, outdoor time is really a really key factor in preventing or slowing myopic progression. Increasing time outdoors is very effective, um, not only on the uh, on preventing or on delaying the onset of myopia, but also slowing myopic progression. And this has been studied over time. And um, and if you know if if you ask me what is one thing you can do, I would say. Well, actually, what are two things you can do? I would say one, limiting screen time, and two, really encourage outdoor activities. And I tell all my patients to spend an hour a day outdoors. We live in Southern California. We have we can totally spend um, an hour a day outdoors. And sometimes parents will say, you know, my kid has a lot of after school activities, or we, we know, we do a lot of homework. We don't really have time to spend outdoors, especially in the winter winter months. Then I say. Do some catch up on the weekend, you know, go for a long bike ride or go for a long walk um, on the weekend to try to get uh, a couple hours of, uh, of outdoor time in. Some things that do not retard myopia. So eye exercises do not work. Um, uh, it, no, no matter what kind of exercises you do uh, for the eyes, they do not retard myopia. Um, so now we're going to go into the more scientific or more what I do as a pediatric ophthalmologist in slowing myopic progression. Uh, one of the more recent uh, studies slash more of uh, what we use currently um, in the pediatric ophthalmologist office is to slow myopic progression is this drop called atropine. Um, I often get this question, you know, is it safe to use atropine? Well, atropine is one of the oldest drops that we have in ophthalmology overall. I use it at full dose for a lot of my patients prior to all of this, prior to screen time, prior to COVID shutdowns. And so it is very, very safe. On top of that, for myopic progression, we use something called a low dose atropine. So 1% atropine, which is the picture that you see on the right here, is the dose that we use what I've been using for other for kids with lazy eyes for a very long time. But for myopic progression, 
um, we actually use a very low dose. We use a one one hundredth of a of a one percent, so zero point zero one percent, zero point zero two five percent, and zero point zero five percent for myopic control. Uh, at this time, as as of today, low dose atropine is not FDA approved yet. Um, it, we are still undergoing process to get FDA approved, but it is not FDA approved at this time. And they are not they're, they're not available at your local pharmacy, so you cannot go to CVS to get it. You cannot, Walgreens, Rite Aid, none of the local pharmacies will carry this. It is made in a compounding pharmacy. So um, it is through a special pharmacy or through a few special pharmacies that we can get this. And now I will present you some data uh, to show you why I think myopic progression, uh, I'm sorry, why atropine slows myopic progression. So this is a paper that came out quite some time ago now, 10 years ago now, 2012, um, that showed that 77% um, reduction in the, pro uh, in the progression of myopia with the use of atropine. So on the the graph on the right shows us that um, in the patient's, um, uh, the top line says this patient did not use any atropine. So still minus three over two years. Uh, I'm sorry, in the the, 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 the the graph on top shows the patient on atropine, they stayed at minus three over two years. But these two lines down on the bottom are the kids who are in the control group and their their myopia got worse. So minus three to minus 4.5 to minus five over, over two years. Um, this was the first study that showed us that atropine low dose does slow progression of myopia. The side effects of using atropine are a few. It's not detrimental, but it does cause a little bit of pupillary dilation. So the pupils are a little bit more dilated. Um, because the pupils are dilated, some kids report some glare uh, when outside, uh, when you know, when spending time outdoors, and then they are a little bit blurry up close. Okay, and so this is another study that came out in two thousand nineteen that showed that what is the optimal concentration for my progression, um, and that the the best concentration or the the concentration that worked the best was the zero point zero five percent that slowed the progression of myopia the most. As you can see on this graph on the right, the blue line showed you that the progression was much slower with the zero point zero five percent. Although zero point zero one percent, the less of the the least of the, 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 the low dose atropine had the least side effects, which is very self or which is very uh, intuitive because the, the, the lower dose gives you less dilation, less glare, less blurry, uh, blurry with near work. Um, although the 0.05%, the higher dose worked the best, but obviously it had the most side effects as well. Um, the two pr prior studies were done in Singapore and in Hong Kong, where uh, myopia is really a almost a pandemic um, for the children there. And so, how do we? How do I apply this to my patients here in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., we actually did a study just to study that as well. And uh, this is a study that was done purely in the U.S. with children that are of Caucasian background, African American, Hispanic as well as Asian, um, and it's a mixed group, which is kind of like our population here, um, of 0.01%, the lowest dose, to see if there's any effect of low-dose atropine for patients, for kids in the U.S. And surprisingly, the 0.01% is not very effective in uh, our population of patients. So here um, are 12 selected U.S. sites uh, of kids between ages 5 and 12. Um, and here on the right is what you see. The blue dots are the placebo and the orange dots are atropine 0.01%. And as you can see, there, there's almost no difference in, um, in my upper progression. And so uh, for children in the U.S., 0.01% may not be the effective dose. And then another uh, interesting study that came out very recently, actually just last month, was um, can low-dose atropine, well, Dr. Roy, you said, you know, low-dose atropine helps for myopia progression, but can I use it to prevent myopia from starting altogether? And there was another study that came out recently that said, Yes, you can use low-dose atropine for myopia prevention. So these 
this the, this drop was given to kids without any myopia. So they're not nearsighted at all. They um they're young kids, they're like four, five, six, seven, and they have no myopia. And they were given 0.05% versus 0.01%. So the high dose versus the low dose. Um, and as you can see, um, the incidence rate of myopia in the 0.05% was 28.4% versus the higher, uh, the, the atropine 0.01% versus the placebo eye drops were really 50% of time the kids did have my, uh, did actually develop myopia. So it looks like the low dose atropine, at least the 0.05% really does prevent kids from developing myopia. Okay, so with that, I will kind of transi transition into, well, you know, when you read in the literature, or when you actually talk to an optometrist or anybody in the community, really, they'll say, you know, my kids are on this really cool contact lens. Um, and that seems to be helping as well. And so we have on one arm, we have the atropine, which is the eye drop. On the other arm, um, there are contact lenses that could also be considered for slowing myopic progression. And there are two kinds of contact lenses that are in the market right now that can do that. One is called orthokeratology, which is in short ortho-K, and another one is called mysite or peripheral defocus lens. Orthokeratology works as, as the picture on the left shows. Basically, what it does is it reshapes the cornea. It's the contact lens that is a hard contact lens that is specifically fitted for your child. So it's personalized. Every, every eyeball gets a different contact lens. You put the contact lens on during sleep and it essentially reshapes the, the, the shape of the cornea so that in the morning when you take it out, um, the cornea stays a certain shape. And because it's a certain shape, it'll bend light differently and therefore it'll focus the light differently onto the back of the eye. And so the child will see clearly without the use of glasses during the day. Um, this only works during the day. And so if you don't wear it every night, then the effect of it wears off. So you have to wear it every single night at bedtime. You put the contacts in, you sleep in the contacts. It reshapes the, the curvature of the cornea. In the morning, the child wakes up, takes out the contacts. They go to school without wearing glasses. And the effect wears off gradually over, over the entire day. And again, you repeat the, the next evening. So if you forget to do it overnight, or if you forget to do it for a couple of days, then the child will be blurry again. So you're not stopping myopia altogether. You're just pushing the cornea so that it's a different shape. And so during the day, you don't have to wear glasses, but overnight, you're still gonna have to wear the, the contacts again over and over, over, you know, over time. And then there's this idea of profoti focus. And this is a little bit more complex to describe and I'll try to do it justice um, to see if you can understand the reason behind why this contact lens works. So the eyeball is not, even though we, use the analogy of having a soccer ball where it's a complete sphere. In reality, the eyeball is not as, as spherical as we use the analogy to be. The eyeball is considered an aspherical structure, meaning that it's actually not a sphere, not a perfect sphere. And therefore, when light shines onto the back of the eye, when the light shines onto the retina, it actually hits the retina at different points. So if it's a perfectly sphere, then everything on the retina gets, you know, every single point on the retina gets the exact same focal point or it gets the exact same image, a clear image. But in reality, that is not the case. And so uh, an, an myopic child or a myopic eye will have, when you are, when you have corrected the, um, the myopia, you do bring the light all the way to the back of the eye. But in reality, in other parts of the retina, you overshoot it. And so on the middle picture, um, the light is perfectly centered on the back of the eyeball in the, in the, in the, in the, in the prime or in the horizontal direction. It may be pretty good in this 45 degrees, but when the light hits it at like 65 degrees, then it actually is an over focus, it goes behind the eye. And so therefore, what happens is then technically, the child is not perfectly clear at all times, and they may be blurry in different directions. And so the ideal would be to actually on the on the right hand most picture to get the light to be focused exactly everywhere 
on the retina perfectly. And that's what the idea of peripheral defocus lens is. It tries to split the beam so that um, the horizontal beam hits the, the back of the eye perfectly. Uh, the, you know, the beam that comes in at 45 degrees hits the retina perfectly. And the beam that comes in at 65 degrees hits the retina perfectly. And so it, the contact lens actually splits the light rays uh, into different small little light rays so that it can be focused exactly on the retina everywhere, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. And this is what we think could help with correcting myopia and preventing myopic progression. And so, um, so this is a soft contact lens, like any other contact lens that we wear. You wear it during the day, the child wears it, you know, like any other contact lens, they put it in the morning, they take it out at night. And the goal of it is so that the light can focus on different portions of the retina. Okay. And in reality, everything that I've described, the orthokeratology, the contact lens that we were talking about, the mycite contact lens, peripheral defocus lens, all the kinds of atropine, what is really my goal for doing this? My goal is so that I can control the myopia. I can control the the, the nearsightedness from going into a, what we consider pathological myopia, right? Going to a, 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 a prescription that is too high and that increases the risk of the child or the adult um, later down in life of having retinal detachment, glaucoma, cataracts, maculopathies. And so really our goal, as this picture shows, is I like to kind of start, I see that your, your child is progressing. They're getting a little bit worse every year. And so rather than having them shoot up with age, I like to flatten the curve or I like to sort of um, uh, change the, the direction of myopic progression where yes, it may still go up, but rather than going at a, at, a, at, a, at a slope that is extremely vertical, I like to flatten it. I like to flatten the curve a little bit so that rather than going from minus two to minus three to minus four every year, we like to go from minus two to minus 2.5 to minus three to minus 3.5. So slow the progression of myopia. I know for a fact that as a child grows, as they get hit puberty, as they hit a growth spurt, their myopia is going to get worse. Um, and there's nothing I can do to prevent that from happening. A child needs to grow and we cannot stop a kid from growing. But my goal is to slow that myopic progression so that we don't end up having all the all the side effects or all the complications um, down the line of you know high myopia or pathological myopia. Okay. So in summary, I think I do have... Um, I, I do feel like uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and virtual classrooms and having kids on screens nowadays is increasing the prevalence of myopia in my own population patients here in Irvine and definitely nationwide and worldwide. Um, I think there are treatments to slow down myopic progression um, that are available. Um, however, is the treatment right for everybody? Is it is this better? Is the eye drop better for you, or is the contact lens better for you? That is is really uh, individualized and personalized, and it depends on what the family wants to do. Um, another thing that I do want to mention is that treatments are needed for many years. It's not. No, you do it and you stop. It's not like a pill you take and you cure the disease. Um, it is something that is slow, just like you know a child grows over many years. This is going to be a long-standing sort of treatment. If you come to see me at seven years old, I, I will say, mom, dad, we're going to do it for at least five years. We may have to do it until we're twelve, maybe until we're thirteen. So it's a so it's a long-term treatment. And unfortunately, during all those years, you're on the on the eye drop, and you have to come back every six months, every year, so that we can do a, a good close follow up. I think if you're interested in this topic, or if you're interested in talking more about this topic. Um, Go visit, you know, the pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, go see your pediatric optometrist. Actually, the optometrists in the community are wonderful at doing this as well. So, I, I encourage you to ask about this um, when you know when you see your optometrist and see if that is an option for you. So, with that, I will stop and take any questions. Um, and so, thank you for listening. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Gore. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, or you can also unmute yourself. Dr. Gore, it looks like you answered every... Oh, here comes one. Here comes a question in the chat. 
So I will read uh, the question and then I'll answer it. So um, the question is, are all screens treated equally? Is a tablet different? That's actually a very good question because I get that all the time. And so I say, uh, all screen, not all screens are treated. Uh, all screens are different. Um, the iPhone, the phone is worse. It's actually the, just the size of the screen. So a phone is worse than a tablet and a tablet is worse than a TV. Um, and so oftentimes I'll say, if you have to do virtual learning, I would recommend doing it on a desktop, for example, rather than a Chromebook because it is a smaller screen. And so the kids have to, you know, you know, you, you get closer to the screen to look at it. And so um, uh, the, a screen is a screen, but a larger screen is better than a smaller screen. Okay, so there's another question. Um, if having one type of amblyopia like hytropia, um, does it affect uh, does it affect uh, orthokeia or contacts? So if you have uh, amblyopia, uh, then it's actually a different type of uh, eye condition. So if you have amblyopia, usually if it's true, like if you don't see out of that eye, then um, orthokeia or contacts really doesn't help. And this is for uh, the orthokeratology contact lens atropine is really for kids who ha have perfect vision with the correction lenses. So if they they're 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 technically supposed to be 2020 uh, with their glasses. So if you don't see 2020 with your glasses, then doing any of that is not going to improve or worsen. Or it, it this is uh, it's it doesn't treat amblyopia. Okay. Um, another question I have in the chat is, I've heard that both wearing glasses and conversely that not wearing glasses strains the eye more, which is more true? Um, so that depends. So the answer to that question is it depends on how much myopia you have. So if you are highly myopic, let's say you're minus four, minus five, um, you're so blurry, you have to wear glasses. And if you don't wear glasses, it makes your myopia worse. Um, if you are like a minus one, minus two, which is what we call low myopia, or I say, yeah, it's a mild amount of prescription, um, then you only need to wear the glasses for driving, only for distance. And so then if you don't wear it for like, you know, reading the computer or looking at your phone, then it doesn't hurt the eyes to do that. So I think the answer to your question is, it depends on what your prescription is. Some prescriptions, you have to wear your glasses and some prescriptions, you don't really need to wear your glasses. And that's, that's so it depends on what your prescription is. And you should probably ask, you know, your optometrist or your ophthalmologist uh, for the answer to, to what your prescription is. Um, another question is, would getting LASIK surgery help prevent or reduce the risk of developing pathological myopia? No, it does not. Um, that's a, actually a really good question um, to the person who, answered, or who asked it. Um, so uh, LASIK surgery just gets rid of the need for, for glasses, but it does not uh, reduce the risk of developing pathological myopia. Um, and LASIK is available for adults, right? So um, it is not available for kids under 18. And obviously I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist. So if you come to me and you say, ah, Dr. Go, I want to get LASIK and you know, your child is 15, I'd say it is not the right time. You have to wait until you're 21 to get it. And the reason is because we wait until your eyeball is fully grown and so until we know what the maximum amount of myopia you have there is before we will counsel you on is LASIK a good option for you or LASIK is not a good option for you. If you have very high myopia, minus 12, minus 13, then you have a very high chance of developing pathologic myopia. Um, and then we actually say LASIK is not the right option for you because that it does not like reduce the risk of any diseases um, from having high myopia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you have any questions that come up later or you want to rewatch the video once we send it out later, feel free to email us at ophthalmology at uci.edu. And if you'd like to register for next month's lecture or next year's lectures, you can visit us online at ophthalmology.uci.edu slash events. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Gore, for such a great presentation. Thank, thank you, everyone. Dr. Gore. Thank you.